It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, and welcome to the 2015 PD&U conference. Uh, this is uh, something that we've been doing for a number of years now. Uh, and it's always been very successful and well attended. And uh, thank you for, for coming today and, and making this yet another successful year. Um, we actually, uh, before I go, I just want to thank Laura Zeitlin, who just introduced me, although she just walked out. But she basically is the organizer of all this, and we really would not be able to have this, all of this, uh, without her effort. So thank you, Laura. All right, well, I won't be speaking today, but I'm, uh, I will be introducing everyone. Uh, I've happened to find five speakers who are much more interesting than me. So the first one, uh, Dr. John Snyder. Uh, he was uh, born and raised in Virginia and then voluntarily came here for schooling uh, to receive his uh, medical school education. He completed his neurology residency here at the University of Michigan, and he is uh, in his second year of fellowship as a movement disorders um, fellow here with us. And uh, he has strong interests in the treatment of movement disorders in medical education, uh, and I think you'll find him a wonderful speaker. So let's welcome Dr. John Snyder. Thank you again for coming today. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Parkinson's disease, basically all of it, uh, in a, kind of a condensed form. Um, just I have no relevant financial disclosures. Uh, I'll be giving you kind of a broad overview of Parkinson's, uh, some background on it, symptoms, both movement and non-movement symptoms, uh, how it's diagnosed, and uh, how we treat it, again, through the movement symptoms, the non-movement symptoms, and some more recent therapies that have been FDA approved as well. I'll start with a little bit of background. Um, so what is Parkinson's disease? It is a chronic condition. It is something that once you get it, it stays with you long term. It's progressive. Uh, it gradually gets worse with time, does gradually progress with time. It's what we call a neurodegenerative disease, which means parts of the brain die over time, and those brain cells that die uh, then result in uh, the disease that we see. And it's characterized by a loss of the movement chemical dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. If you look at the picture there on the right, there's a dark streak here that's the substantia nigra with dopamine cells, uh, very healthy in a normal person. And over here, you lose those dopamine cells in the substantia nigra. There's not, you don't have that dark streak anymore. Um, one out of 1,000 people uh, have it. And if you look at people who are older than 65, one out of 100 people have this. Uh, we're still working out the specific cause, why some people get it, why some people don't. That's an active area of research. Uh, most cases uh, are not hereditary, which is to say they're not passed down by family members from mom or dad to son or daughter, um, although some, uh, there, are, there are minority cases that are uh, hereditary in nature. Um, in terms of the symptoms of it, um, I'll talk about the motor, the movement symptoms first. And when we talk about the movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease, we often will use the phrase Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism are the movement symptoms uh, that can be seen in Parkinson's disease or one of its mimics. The classic movement symptoms, one is bradykinesia, which just means less movement, lack of movement, uh, smallness, slowness uh, of movement. Um, the second is rigidity or, or stiffness. The third is a tremor at rest, and I contrast that with a tremor when you're doing things, which is an action tremor. A tremor at rest is more when you're relaxed, not paying attention, uh, when your muscles are relaxed. And then also imbalance, uh, gait instability. Uh, these are the cardinal features of Parkinson's, the cardinal uh, movement symptoms. Um, how this may present on a day-to-day -day basis uh, for patients who have Parkinson's disease, I'm just going to bring these all out. Uh, for bradykinesia, again, the less movement, uh, the smallness or slowness, you may note shuffling or slowness of gait, smaller step, the more stooped posture. Your handwriting may get smaller with time. Your voice may get softer. You may have trouble with excess saliva or drooling because you're not swallowing as much. Again, less movement. Uh, your face may become less expressive. Relatives or friends may comment that you just aren't as expressive with your face. That's the classic mask-like faces that you may hear about. Uh, there may be some decreased arm swinging when you walk. A very common complaint is a feeling of weakness. And then when your doctor examines you, we see that the strength is actually quite good, but it's that feeling of weakness that's likely due to things aren't moving as fast as, as they normally would, and that contributes to this sense of generalized weakness. Uh, in terms of the stiffness and the rigidity, uh, you may just feel stiff. You may have trouble getting up from low car seats or 
soft chairs, trouble buttoning buttons, zipping zippers, trouble turning over in bed, again, due to the stiffness. In terms of the tremor at rest, um, you most likely notice it if you're sitting on a couch, watching TV, kind of relaxed with your hands in your lap. Um, and then obviously with imbalance, trouble maintaining balance or falls, um, more stumbling, uh, feeling unstable on your feet. There's also non-motor symptoms. These are the non-movement symptoms. These are often the quote-unquote invisible symptoms of Parkinson's, the ones that aren't quite as easily apparent to someone just looking at you. Uh, choking on fluid or slurring of, of speech, um, autonomic symptoms, things like lightheadedness when you stand up, trouble emptying your bladder, trouble with constipation, erectile dysfunction, uh, a loss of sense of smell that often comes actually quite early in the disease in many patients. Uh, we think that may actually be a precursor in many cases to the, actu to the, uh, the other motor symptoms. Uh, memory problems may develop, um, um, hallucinations possibly over time. Mood changes, people with Parkinson's are much more likely to have depression or anxiety or just apathy, just not wanting to do things, kind of the, the lump on the log type uh, feeling. Fatigue, a very common symptom of Parkinson's. Pain, uh, dream reenactment, punching, kicking, running in your sleep, yelling out, screaming in your sleep. Um, and sleep apnea, um, your airway closes off when you sleep and then you open it back up again. Um, it doesn't wake you up, but it can pull you out of sleep, and that can contribute to symptoms. Now, one thing I stress with these non-motor symptoms, everyone with Parkinson's disease is different. It doesn't mean that if you have Parkinson's, you're going to get all these symptoms. These are just possible symptoms you may get, and we like to keep an eye on uh, just in case you do get them, because we can often help with these symptoms. Um, in terms of how Parkinson's disease is diagnosed, um, the only definitive diagnosis uh, is through autopsy, um, and brain tissue will show characteristic patterns of Parkinson's disease. I usually don't recommend that uh, on first line the first time I meet a patient. Um, we have other ways of sorting this out, fortunately. Um, practically speaking, though, the diagnosis really is it's clinical, which means it's made by hearing the patient's story, by doing an exam. Usually it's diagnosed by a neurologist or a movement disorder specialist. Um, a practical definition of Parkinson's disease that, that I often use uh, is you have motor symptoms of Parkinson's, the movement symptoms. You have a significant uh, response to adequate doses of carbidopa, levodopa, cinemet, dopamine replacement, or one of its similar agents for at least a period of time. And we don't see evidence of one of the Parkinson's disease mimic conditions, the Parkinson's plus conditions as we sometimes call them. In terms of additional testing, are there additional labs or studies that you need to diagnose it? Not required. Uh, other, other workup is not routinely required or ordered to diagnose Parkinson's. It is a clinical diagnosis, uh, unless there's some atypical symptoms, symptoms that don't quite fit or that would make us more concerned that something else is going on or one of the mimics may be going on, uh, then we may consider additional testing. But usually you don't need additional lab work or imaging. It's a clinical diagnosis. Um, a quick word about the Parkinson's plus syndromes, the mimics. Um, they're called this because Parkinson's, they're Parkinson's plus because it's Parkinsonism, the movement symptoms of Parkinson's, plus something else. Uh, and this is, the plus something else is usually uh, what brings people to clinical attention. So for example, Lewy body dementia, you get Parkinsonism, the movement symptoms, plus early memory problems, usually associated with visual, visual hallucinations and fluctuations in attention. Now, people can get memory problems as Parkinson's disease goes along, but if we saw very early severe memory problems, it may make us think that it's one of these mimics, such as Lewy body dementia. Another mimic, progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP. This is Parkinsonism plus very early profound gait problems, falling problems, very early in the disease, very severe. Uh, oftentimes with specific eye movement abnormalities that your neurologist would, would look for on exam. Uh, multiple systems atrophy, uh, MSA, another mimic. Parkinsonism plus very early and severe autonomic problems. Every time you stand up, your blood pressure drops like a rock and you pass right out. Severe urinary retention or constipation, severe erectile dysfunction, um, maybe also with coordination problems. Again, people can have these symptoms as Parkinson's progresses, but if we saw these symptoms very early and very severe, it does raise our antenna, could this be one of the mimics? And then something also worth noting, medication-induced Parkinsonism. This is when we see someone who looks to all the world like they have Parkinson's disease, but we also see they're on a medication, such as an antipsychotic or anti-nausea medication that is blocking dopamine and is effectively causing medication-induced Parkinsonism. 
um, and we stop the medication, uh, and oftentimes that can improve symptoms. So again, these mimics that just in case you hear about them, these are not Parkinson's disease, but they can look a lot like them. Um, in terms of the treatment of Parkinson's disease, so we'll start again with the uh, kind of a feeling of the general course of the disease, and again, no two Parkinson's patients are alike. It's different for everyone, but generally speaking, uh, again, there's no crystal ball for how fast or slow it will progress or what symptoms people will get. Everyone's unique. Uh, it is a chronic and slowly progressive disease. This is not something that changes overnight. Uh, this is something that is gradually progressive. It's not a fatal condition. You don't die of Parkinson's per se in the same way that you don't die of diabetes, uh, but it can contribute to a variety of symptoms which can worsen and complicate health, and this kind of complications must be dealt with. We don't have anything right this second that's going to slow the disease, reverse the disease, stop the course. We have symptomatic treatments, so if the symptoms bug you, we can help treat the symptoms, but we don't have anything right at this second that's going to reverse or slow down the disease or undo the damage. We're, it's an active area of research, obviously, but at this time, uh, we, we don't have that option. And because treatment is symptomatic, if the symptoms bug you, we treat it. If the symptoms don't bug you, we keep an eye on things. Uh, the focus of treatment really should be on improving day-to-day -day functioning. What do you want to do that you can't do as well uh, or you can't do at all, and how can we improve that so you can go about living your life, doing your day-to-day -day things? Um, again, our goal being to keep you as independent and safe as possible for as long as possible. Uh, the general course of treatment, again, different for everyone. There's often a kind of a honeymoon period of excellent motor control for years at a relatively low dose of medications. Gradually, the medications do become less effective. They may last for shorter periods of time. You may get more of this off time. So off time is times during the day when your symptoms are not well controlled versus on time, which are the symptom times of the day when your symptoms are well controlled. So you may get more, poor, more times during the day when your symptoms are not well controlled. Those times may be more unpredictable when they're going to occur. Again, this is not due, and I'll touch on this in a little while, it's not due to the fact that your medication is not working or stopped working by itself, it's just that the disease is progressing with time. You may over time require escalating doses of medication, you may have more symptoms that get in the way of your day-to-day -day functioning, more times during the day when your symptoms are not well controlled, you may develop the fidgety wiggly movements uh, as a side effect of the medications, and the non-movement symptoms may become more prominent over time and more difficult to control. Again, I don't want to paint a doom and gloom picture here. People usually do well over time, and these are just, um, you know, um, this is how uh, some of the symptoms could develop over time. Um, but again, the, the, per the point of this is, um, you know, very close attention needs to be paid over time because the disease um, can get more complicated uh, the longer you have it and needs close attention. Questions that will guide a neurologist's uh, treatment of the disease, the biggest thing is, are you happy with the level of symptom control? Uh, I say a happy patient is a happy neurologist. Um, if you're happy with your level of control, I'm probably not going to be doing a whole lot to, to change things because you're functioning the way you want to function. Um, I warn patients not to aim for perfection. We often don't get 100% back to the way you were before the disease, but we aim for satisfaction. If you're happy with your level of control, maybe you have a little bit of tremor, maybe you're a little stiff, but gosh, you know, I can do what I want to do, and you know, I'd like to kind of hold the fort here. That's very reasonable. And a lot of times these decisions are very, they are always uh, very patient-centered, patient-driven, how the patient feels um, they're doing. We often want to know what ways you're limited. Um, are the medications effective enough? Are they lasting long enough? Um, are you having side effects? Um, and then uh, one thing I'm going to touch on in a little more depth is are you having the dyskinesias? These are the fidgety, wiggly movements like Michael J. Fox had um, uh, that can be a, a side effect of the, of the medications. And also, are these movements bothersome to the patient? And I underline that because patients can often get dyskinesias, fidgety, wiggly movements, and it doesn't bother them. It doesn't get in the way of their functioning. Yeah, they're wiggling, but it doesn't bother them. It may bother the family. The family may be a bit freaked out, but the patients are like, yeah, I'm happy with this. I'm, my symptoms are well controlled. No problem. So it's important, are the wiggling motions bothersome or limiting to the patient in terms of whether we just observe them or whether we need to do something to, to treat them? Um, this is a rather extreme example of the fidgety wiggly movements. Um, again, these are dyskinesias. They could be oftentimes much more subtle than this. They may just look like someone being a little restless, a little fidgety. Um, again, this kind of sense of just kind of like almost ants in the pants, fidgety, wiggly, restlessness, discomfort, you know, looks uncomfortable, but doesn't necessarily mean it is. 
Um, one thing I want to stress to patients is, so these dyskinesias are very different than your rest tremor. And we treat rest tremor versus dyskinesias very differently. So it's important your doctor knows if you say my shaking's getting worse or my movements are getting worse, do you mean the dyskinesias, the, widgety, the, the wiggly fidgety movements often associated with, timing, with uh, when you take your medication? Those are getting worse? Or is it that your rest tremor is getting worse? And being able to differentiate those two to your, to your doctor is important um, in terms of how we, we deal with it and treat it. Again, many patients can go many years without developing dyskinesias. For those who do develop them, we have good options to treat them, and many times the dyskinesias themselves are not overly bothersome, too. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, for the movement symptoms, uh, we have a number of options that are all important, medications, exercise, uh, possibility of surgery, and I'll talk about that, and I'll also discuss some of the new FDA-approved treatments as well. Um, so when it comes to medications, I think we at University of Michigan, and I think really on a, on a national and international level, are really realizing that, that carbidopa, levodopa, Cinemet really is uh, the best option we have. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's been around for ages, and it really does the job well. It's basically dopamine replacement. You don't have enough dopamine in your brain, we're replacing it with this dopamine supplement. The levodopa is basically the dopamine. The carbidopa is the stuff that keeps the dopamine where it should be in your brain and not elsewhere in your body where it could cause more side effects. It's basically the most effective and well-tolerated drug we have for controlling the movement symptoms. And I think there's a strong argument that could be made to usually start with this medication for treatment. Um, possible side effects. Over time, you can develop dyskinesias as a side effect. Again, this is a, um, a, a side effect of the medication itself. Um, if you were to stop the medication, the dyskinesias would go away. Um, people can get nausea or GI upset with Cinemet. People can sometimes get uh, confusion or sleepiness, and if they're more prone to uh, memory problems or, or hallucinations, it could uh, provoke hallucinations. Uh, and sometimes people will note lightheadedness, particularly on standing on this medication. Again, these are side effects we can often work around, um, but are things to be aware of. Despite these possible side effects, it's still better tolerated than the other Parkinson's medications for the most part. Um, some people may say to take it on an empty stomach because it's absorbed better. Um, I'm often keen on telling people to take it uh, actually uh, with meals. Um, it may absorb a little less well, but it often can be much more tolerated from a nausea GI standpoint. Um, if you're tolerating it well on an empty stomach, that's fine, but certainly um, if you're having any issues with nausea or GI upset, having it with, with some food can be a, um, a good way of tolerating it. Uh, I will warn people, usually don't take it right before bed because you're going to sleep through the symptomatic benefit. Remember, this is a symptomatic medication to help the movement symptoms. Uh, I also want to stress being consistent with the timing is important, um, both for, for keeping a, a regular schedule through the day and making it easier, easier for your doctors to know how to adjust things to better control your symptoms. A few other words on carbidopa levodopa. It best helps with the smallness, slowness, the rigidness, and the, the rest tremor to a slightly lesser extent. It really doesn't help a whole lot with balance or falls. It, Sometimes can help with freezing, sometimes not. And it doesn't do anything for the non-movement symptoms that we talked about, depression, fatigue, um, you know, memory problems. It really is for the movement issues themselves. Some myths, and again, these are false things that uh, until actually very recently, many patients and, and really doctors believe these are myths. There's myths that Cinemet, Carbidopa, Levodopa has more side effects and is less well tolerated than other Parkinson's medications. I think there's good data out there now that actually is better tolerated uh, than many of the other medications. There's a myth that it wears off uh, the more you use it. Once you start taking it, there's a timer that started, and when that timer wears off, it's not going to work as well. That's not correct. Um, you know, this idea that you got to save it till the very end to really make it count, that's been shown to really not be correct. Um, it's the disease progresses with time, so the medication becomes less effective with time because the disease progresses, but it's not that if you start the medication earlier, there's a set timer that then starts, that is how long it's going to work. Uh, there's a myth that it will make Parkinson's worse in the long run. That's not true either. It does not make things worse in the long run, uh, whether you take it or whether you don't. Some facts that kind of echo that. Again, it's the best tolerated and I think most effective treatment for the movement symptoms, both in the short and long term. 
It doesn't wear off the more it's used in the sense that uh, the medication doesn't uh, become less effective. It's just that the disease progresses and you need more medication because the disease is farther along. In the same way, someone with diabetes may need more blood sugar medication control uh, far as the disease progresses. Um, taking it early, again, does not result in worse long-term symptoms. There's no harm in starting it early as a first-line treatment, and I don't think there's a compelling reason to delay. Um, in fact, if anything, having better control for more years, I think, is, is a, a, a definite incentive to, to have it on board. Uh, it's definitely more cost-effective. Some of the other Parkinson's medications can be quite expensive. Um, and again, I think it overall results in better control in the long run. Now, that's not to say that if someone started you on a different Parkinson's medication that they're wrong or that, there's, that that's uh, an incorrect choice, but I just think that uh, there's more and more evidence that carbidopa, levodopa is a really excellent first-line choice. Uh, and many, many neurologists you may talk to may not realize that. Uh, I think that's information we're still trying to get out as well, so I want to make sure you all are aware. There's additional agents that can be used for Parkinson's. These are what we call kind of uh, adjunctive agents, uh, uh, agents that we tend to use in addition to the carbidopa, levodopa, if we need a little more oomph. Um, dopamine agonists like pramipexol, ropinirol, rotigotine um, that do have potential side effects greater chance for worsening memory or hallucinations. Um, I do see a greater chance of kind of disinhibited behavior, so patients going out and spending their life savings gambling or buying silly things. Um, patients who actually get very hypersexual and, and uh, that becomes very frustrating for their spouse. Uh, I've seen patients empty out their bank accounts on this medication. Again, not to scare you to think this is a, you know, a terrifying medication. It can be very helpful. It just means you have to keep an eye on these things when you're on it. Um, sleep attacks, another potential system as well. People can be driving along and all of a sudden they just conk out or they have an overwhelming fatigue and they have to conk out. That can be very dangerous as well. Again, just symptoms to be aware of, to monitor, and if you have these, you should let your doctor know. The MAOB inhibitors like selegiline or resagiline uh, are quite expensive. Uh, theoretically, there could be a risk if you're also on an antidepressant and you take those. Uh, certainly needs to be closely monitored if you're on both. Intacapone, also called Comptan, uh, is really good for giving you an extra 30 minutes or so of, of on time per dose. It makes the Cinemet, the Carbidopa, Levodopa, last a little bit longer, basically. Um, it doesn't work by itself, though, uh, so it needs to be given with the Cinemet. Um, and of course, it can worsen any side effects that Cinemet may cause, too. Um, and finally, Amantadine. Um, can be a very helpful medication for dyskinesias, the wiggly, fidgety movements. Um, it may slightly help with tremor, probably not a whole lot, but uh, mainly is used if you get a very wiggly, fidgety uh, as well. Um, not great if you have significant memory problems. I'm going to make a quick note about anticholinergics, one in particular, trihexafenadyl, also called Artane. Generally speaking, and this is you know generality, we don't recommend it for Parkinson's disease due to a lot of potential side effects and the fact that it really only helps with tremor. It doesn't really help with the other Parkinson's <laughs> symptoms. I have many patients who are on this uh, or come in to me as second opinion. We take them off it and they say, wow, I feel so much better being off this medication. Um, we really only use it kind of as a, as a second line, third line, fourth line treatment for refractory rest tremor. Um, again, you know, it's it has its place, but it's something that I warn people should not be a first-line agent for the most for most patients, uh, and it should be used with caution. I'm going to switch focus from the medications to exercise, which in my mind is as important as any medication we can ever give people with Parkinson's. Um, everyone with Parkinson's disease should be involved in scheduled safe exercise. Study after study after study have shown it's as good as anything we can prescribe. There's even some data that it may provide some neuroprotection, uh, brain protection from Parkinson's. Whatever you enjoy doing that gets you moving on a regular basis, do that. Uh, there's not one that's better than the other. There's been great data showing things like this list here, walking, biking, boxing, dancing, tai chi, yoga. Whatever you enjoy and gets you moving, do that and do it regularly. Um, the patients who exercise do so much better in the short and long term uh, compared to those who don't. Um, there's actually convincing data coming out now that even day-to-day -day household activities, going around and cleaning up around the house, doing some gardening, washing the windows, even those little activities during the day can also provide significant day-to-day -day benefit. So, you know, anything you can do to kind of get up and, and do things can provide incredible benefit for you. 
Uh, additional therapies as needed uh, to know that they're out there. Physical therapy or occupational therapy um, can be very helpful. They can work with you particularly for walking, gait retraining, strengthening in the legs, balance. Uh, I do say have a low threshold to ask your doctor about these. Don't wait till you start falling left and right to ask about it. If you're feeling unstable on your feet, uh, or if you have trouble doing day-to-day -day activities, uh, this may be quite beneficial for you. They can uh, do that locally. You don't have to come to a major medical institution in order to get that either. Sometimes they can even do it out of your house if you're particularly infirmed. There's a similar, there's a, an aspect of it uh, 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 called LSVT big and loud therapy. This is intensive physical and speech therapy focused more on getting around the bradykinesia, the smallness, the slowness. So you, they teach you to swing your arms bigger, to walk bigger, to talk louder, so that the smallness of movement uh, is uh, less of a problem. Uh, it's a little more intensive therapy. Uh, the big portion is through physical therapy. The loud portion is through speech and language therapy. Uh, you want to make sure your therapists are certified in this, and there's a website I put on there that you can search for uh, therapists in your area who are certified in that and you just get a prescription from your doctor and, and do that. Speech and language therapy can be quite helpful in and of itself, uh, helpful for speaking problems, slurring of speech problems, swallowing problems, uh, can be very helpful to be evaluated there as well. Uh, social work, I put a big plug in there. They're very helpful for so many domains. If additional resources or assistance are needed, emotional support for the family, for the patient, you know, if, if there's issues at home, if, whatever, you know, if, if, if things aren't going the way you want them to, th these are wonderful people to talk with, uh, and I highly recommend having them involved. Um, other things, if you're worried about safety at home, falls at home, they can do safety evaluations, you know, where to put up some bars or watch out for loose rugs, just ways to make things safer. Uh, and if there's any concern for driving, and, and either from the patient or from the family, again, focus on safety in Parkinson's. If there's any concern that you could use some tuning up on your driving or, or, or you know, a little brushing up, there can be some uh, driving safety evaluations. If you get them through a local institution, they're not going to cut up your license. They're just going to see how you're doing, give you some tips and tricks, uh, and kind of go from there. Um, so that can be helpful as well. Other treatments, uh, deep brain stimulation. Um, is basically uh, you put electrodes in the brain. You can see here there's an electrode going deep into the brain. It's then connected to a wire that comes down underneath the skin, all underneath the skin, to kind of a pacemaker battery in your chest, again, underneath the skin. Uh, and it administer electrical pulses. You don't feel it pulsing in you, but it administers electrical pulses that can improve the movement symptoms, the, the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, what does it do? Uh, it can improve the motor symptoms, particularly the off time, the times during the day when you're not getting good control. It can make it more predictable. It can in, uh, increase the amount of time during the day that you have good symptom control. Uh, it'll only provide as much benefit as the best response to Cinemet, carbidopa, levodopa. If you have a, cis, a symptom that has had no response to Cinemet, deep brain simulation is not going to help with that. I really think of deep brain simulation kind of as electrical Cinemet, basically. Um, Deep brain simulation can reduce your medication requirements. It usually doesn't eliminate them. You're beyond some small, you know, potentially small dose of medication, but it can reduce how much you need. And it can certainly be very helpful for the dyskinesias, the wiggly, fidgety movements, if those are bothersome. What it doesn't do, deep brain simulation does not alter, alter the course of the disease. It does not slow it down. It does not reverse it. It does not stop it. It doesn't help with the non-movement symptoms, you know, speech problems, thinking problems, lightheadedness problems, mood, depression. Uh, doesn't help with those, and in some cases it could worsen them a bit. And that's why when we're considering deep brain stimulation for people, we see if those issues are already problematic, because we don't want to make something that's bad significantly worse to a way that it would impair you. And again, it doesn't improve anything that hasn't helped, that hasn't been helped by Cinemet, Carbidopa, Levodopa, with the one exception of rest tremor. It can help a bit with rest tremor, even if that's refractory to the medications. Uh, when you should consider deep brain stimulation, it's not something that we recommend right off the bat because there is risk with any surgery. And if you can get good, good control of symptoms with medication, why take the risk right off the bat? Um, we considered in people who have a clear diagnosis of Parkinson's disease who've responded well at some point to carbidopa, levodopa. Uh, with movement symptoms that are getting in the way of your day-to-day -day life, who we've tried all the good oral medication therapies and that's just not cutting it, who don't have significant like dementia or uncontrolled depression or mood symptoms. Again, we don't want to worsen those with surgery. 
There is risk with surgery. With this, uh, depending, it varies a little institution to institution, but a, a reasonable number to quote is there's a 3% risk with surgery that you could have stroke, bleed, infection, or some problem with the actual equipment that requires replacement. Um, again, 97% chance that you know, it's gonna be worthwhile, but that's, that's not an insignificant risk, and it's not something we jump people into unless their symptoms really you know, have failed everything else and they really are impaired by this. And it's, again, a very patient-centered decision about whether to go through with it or not. Um, again, there is some chance it can worsen to some extent thinking, speech, and mood, uh, and balance as well. So again, there could be some, some trade-offs as well. A word on a couple of new FDA-approved therapies. Uh, these are mainly used more in advanced disease or special circumstances. These are not first-line things that we throw out there. Uh, first is a new, basically long-acting Cinemat called Ritari, and you may have already heard about Cinemat Carbidopa Levodopa CR, which is kind of a sort of long-acting, but this is a, a really true long-acting um, uh, Cinemat. Uh, it increases the on time, the time during the day when your symptoms are well controlled, uh, by about one or two hours. So it gives you an extra one or two hours a day um, of, of uh, symptom control compared to uh, Cinemat. Um, it's best used for people who have significant kind of off times um, and when the other medications just aren't cutting it anymore. Uh, these are the types of patients who are probably approaching uh, consideration for deep brain stimulation surgery anyway, but this can also be a helpful medication to buy you a couple more hours during the day of better symptom control. Um, it has the same side effects as Cinemet, Carbidopa Levodopa. It is quite expensive, so that it's a new medication. It's fancy, sparkly, so, so keep that in mind. Another new FDA-approved treatment is the Duopa intestinal gel pump. We're basically pumping carbidopa levodopa directly into your gut um, uh, at all times. Uh, a continuous infusion uh, uh, through a small tube uh, that comes into your intestine. Uh, similar to the Ritari, it probably gives you a couple extra hours of, of good symptom control during the day. Uh, it's pretty safe, uh, and it's probably a reasonable option um, if you're, you know, maybe not quite at the deep brain simulation standpoint yet, but you're wondering if you could maybe do a less invasive option for some better control, or maybe you're not a deep brain simulation candidate, and this could be a, a less invasive option for a little better control. Um, there is some, most people do have some minor surgical side effects in the first few weeks, so you gotta make sure you're at a center who uh, has people who can respond to you when, if you have side effects or tube problems or this or that. Again, special circumstance for people who have more advanced disease who are kind of more on the cusp of the kind of the deep brain simulation consideration side. Um, talking about the non-motor symptoms, the non-movement symptoms, and I kind of have the tip of the iceberg picture there because oftentimes you know, when, when the movement symptoms are well controlled, we look at someone and say, oh, you're not tremoring anymore, you're not stiff anymore, things must be going great for you, you're, you're just fantastic. And they don't see these invisible symptoms, these, these, these other symptoms that can be just as debilitating, just as bothersome, if not more, but that you may not notice unless your doctor asks about them, unless you volunteer them. So these are just as important as any movement symptoms in Parkinson's. Um, these are the ones I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the, the memory problems and dementia, as well as the fatigue, will be discussed in detail at later lectures, so um, I'll, I'll hold off on those ones. Um, but uh, let's talk about some of the other non-movement symptoms. So depression and anxiety, very common in Parkinson's disease. Classic symptoms of depression, feeling sad or down, losing interest in things, just not wanting to do things. I contrast that a little with the apathy in Parkinson's, which can be a little different. Apathy kind of lump on a log, but still interested, still upbeat. With, with depression, feeling sad or down, maybe you're not sleeping as much, or maybe you're sleeping way too much. Maybe your appetite isn't very good, or maybe your appetite is way too much. Maybe you feel like your, your concentration, your memory, your energy is low. Again, these are somewhat nonspecific symptoms. There's a lot of things that can cause these, but if you say to yourself, gosh, I'm having these symptoms, you know, this may be some, some depression that, that may be worth looking into treating. Um, treatment can include medications for uh, antidepressants, but just as importantly, talk therapy, talking to a therapist, counselor, social worker, um, maybe seeing geriatric psychiatry uh, who are specialized in depression and patients who are older who, who have Parkinson's disease uh, can be quite helpful, quite effective, quite useful. I do note that sometimes people have uh, some depression associated with the wearing off of their medications. At the end of their Cinemet dose, when their symptoms get bad, they feel really down in the dumps. Then they take their medication, they feel very upbeat, and they're feeling great. With that, we treat it a little bit more that it's a wearing off phenomenon. Uh, it's a more Parkinson's motor symptom phenomenon versus people who just feel down pretty much all the time or most of the time, we think more depression. So be aware of that, keep an eye on that. Hallucinations, 
uh, can be seen uh, in patients who have long-standing Parkinson's disease. It can also be a side effect sometimes of some of the Parkinson's medications. So if you start a new medication or you crank up the dose and you start seeing you know, visual hallucinations, things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, you want to let your doctor know. Um, one important question for patients who have this, particularly in the long term, is how bad are they? If you occasionally see a, you know, a, a small child who's really cute and he's standing there and you say, you know, hi, and it, that's about it, it's not scary, it's not bothersome, it's not disruptive, you may say, well, let's just, you know, keep an eye on things, and if it starts to get disruptive, if it starts to get scary, then there's treatment options there, um, or, you know, maybe adjust medications. But if, if it's non-bothersome or rare, we may opt to keep an eye on it. Um, the best medications to treat hallucinations. Um, I mentioned earlier that most antipsychotics can actually cause Parkinson's disease because they block dopamine, um, which you already are low on in Parkinson's. Um, there's a couple medications that don't really block dopamine but can still help with hallucinations. Clozapine uh, is a, a very effective one. It's a pain uh, to uh, monitor, though. You need to get blood draws very frequently because of the potential risk that it can make your blood counts come down. So if you start this medication, you're going to be getting blood draws on a pretty regular basis, certainly initially, and even in the long term as they space it out some. Another one, quetiapine, Seroquel may be helpful. But again, the point here is you want to avoid the normal antipsychotics because that's going to make the Parkinson's way worse. Um, again, I specify that again. Your doctor should know not to give you the other normal antipsychotics, if at all humanly possible, because that's going to worsen the Parkinson's because it's going to block your dopamine and you need every bit of dopamine you can get. Um, some patients may benefit from a memory medication. Sometimes that helps uh, hallucinations as well. Having geriatric psychiatry again involved could be very helpful. They're pros at dealing with this. Uh, and you may need to consider going down on your Parkinson's medications, because again, the Parkinson's medications can worsen hallucinations. It's a balance. Uh, moving forward, uh, some other non-movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, so the REM sleep behavior disorder, which is kind of the dream reenactment, kicking, punching, running in your sleep. If it's infrequent, if it's mild, you can just keep an eye on it. Uh, if it's more bothersome, uh, you're falling out of bed, you're throwing yourself at a wall, you're punching or kicking your spouse, your spouse is having to sleep in another room because of this, that's when you want to consider treatment. Uh, we have very safe, very reasonable treatments for it. You can try some melatonin before bed. That's actually been shown. It's an all-natural vitamin, basically. It's in everyone's body. Regulates sleep cycles. Can be very helpful. If that doesn't do it, a low dose of clonazepam, clonopin before bed, can also be very helpful in quieting those down uh, to make it so it's not dangerous or bothersome. Um, people who have REM sleep behavior disorder and Parkinson's are certainly at increased risk for that sleep apnea that I mentioned earlier. People who have untreated sleep apnea, it can increase the risk of depression, memory problems, lightheadedness, having to go to the bathroom a bunch of times at night, fatigue during the day, sleepiness during the day. In the long run, it can increase your risk of stroke or heart attacks. The point is, if you have sleep apnea, it's really worth your time to get it diagnosed and treated because it can provide all sorts of symptomatic benefit if you treat it. Insomnia, um, what to do about that, um, can be due to a lot of causes, but generally one of the first things we look at is good sleep hygiene. Try to avoid taking a bunch of naps during the day. Don't watch TV or, or do anything exciting right before bed. Um, try to keep the lights low at night, not really bright. Try to tell your body it's time to go to bed. Don't drink nighttime caffeine. Avoid stressful activities. Um, if you have underlying depression or anxiety, that can certainly, one of its cardinal features is trouble sleeping, so getting that treated can be important. If you have issues sleeping because you're really stiff or your Parkinson's symptoms are not well controlled, then uh, working to control the nighttime Parkinson's symptoms is worthwhile. Um, if you have frequent urination at night, talking to your primary care doctor to see if they can help you with that can be useful. You may consider some prescription sleep aids. Uh, and if it's really refractory, a uh, sleep clinic can actually be quite helpful in this as well, uh, as can um, looking for sleep apnea, which could also be contributing. Um, we talked about some of the autonomic problems, the blood pressure problems. Uh, when you stand up, your blood pressure drops, you feel lightheaded. Um, first, second, and third treatment for this, plenty of fluids, you know, salt your food. Again, if, obviously, if you have heart problems or another reason to, to limit this, you want to let your doctor know. But uh, generally speaking, staying well hydrated with water, sugar-free Gatorade, that sort of thing uh, is important. Uh, coffee doesn't quite count. That can dehydrate you. Soda doesn't quite count. That can dehydrate you. Uh, but staying hydrated, salting your food a bit can be very useful. Obviously, taking your time, going from lying to sitting, sitting to standing, particularly first thing in the morning or overnight. 
um, working with your primary care doctor, people with Parkinson's in the long run may actually need their blood pressure medications weaned down over time because they're getting this lightheadedness on standing. Um, and so you may need to work with your primary care doctor to actually work on maybe cutting down the blood pressure medications a little bit if possible. Uh, if you elevate the head of your bed a bit or use a wedge pillow, uh, that actually tricks your body's internal system and can make it so that during the day you have less of this issue. Um, and there may be some consideration for medications that can actually raise your blood pressure a bit. Um, one thing I'll, I'll warn people with these medications if you're on them uh, for raising blood pressure is you want to avoid taking them right before bed because if uh, you lay down and your blood pressure skyrockets, it could put you at increased risk for other health problems. So you want to take it during the daytime hours, not right before bed if you're on one of these blood pressure increasing medications. People who have constipation, first, second, and third is still going to be fluids, dietary fiber, just day-to-day -day lifestyle stuff. If that doesn't do it, maybe a mild laxative scheduled or a mild stool softener scheduled. And if it's really becoming problematic, then it may be worthwhile seeing your primary care doctor or a GI specialist, a gastrointestinal specialist to help with that. And then finally, I'll close with just some great informational resources. Um, uh, this is not an exhaustive list at all, um, but, uh, but some of the, the national organizations that are reputable sources, there's a lot online that you can't trust. These are sources you can trust for more information, um, support groups, um, resources, new info on research, et cetera. I'll take any questions. So the question is, there's a, a, research, a small research uh, paper that came out regarding a chemotherapy medication to try it on patients who had Parkinson's and I think memory problems as well maybe. Um, and it uh, apparently in that small percentage of, in that small population may have had some um, benefit. Um, and so they're looking more into that. Um, but it's still very experimental, very small study. So um, we have to see how that bears out. So um, is depression intrinsic to Parkinson's? Is it something that Parkinson's is causing? Or is it just that the, you, know, you can't move around as much, you're, you know, you're, you've got Parkinson's and you're feeling kind of low and bummed out about that? Um, can be both, but definitely there is an intrinsic component. There's something about Parkinson's disease, the way it affects the chemicals in the brain, that can make people depressed regardless of, of the, uh, kind of how bummed out they are about the condition, how limited they are about the condition. Um, which is another reason that it, you know, the movement symptoms may be great, but people can still be depressed um, despite that. So, so the, the question was, if you've already had deep brain simulation surgery, would you consider trying the Ritari, the long-acting Cinemet, uh, or trying the, the Duo, Duopa um, intestinal gel pump then on top of that, uh, on top of the DBS? Um, I don't have personal experience um, in that sense. I'm not sure, Dr. Chu, if you have further thoughts in that regard. The new medications are really just reformulations of Cinemet. So, and we know that you can use Cinemet on top of deep brain stimulation. Uh, they just work, uh, in, in, they're just absorbed differently. Uh, and so there's no reason to think that they can't be tried or that they wouldn't necessarily work. But they are very expensive. So um, it's, it's one of those things that I think going in the future, if deep brain stimulation is not giving you the effect that you want, uh, I think it's reasonable to consider. Uh, trying these medications. Okay. Yes? Uh, my neurologist mentioned development of a patch of this with those medications that was worried about. So we do have, um, currently there's something, uh, uh, already the dopamine agonists, there's something called rotigotine patch, which already exists, which is a, a dopamine agonist, one of the uh, adjunctive agents that I mentioned, uh, that, that is available in patch form. Um, in terms of things like, you know, Cinemet patches or Cinemet gels, things like that, um, I think that there has been some research in that regard, but I'm not sure if, there, if there's been something that's uh, currently on the market. Yeah, so uh, in terms of, there actually is in development a patch of Cinemet of levodopa right now. I think the last I heard, it's this big. So uh, it's, it's really not practical. Uh, the patch that uh, Dr. Snyder was talking about is retigotine. So retigotine, uh, it's also called Nupro, is the brand name. And the, uh, it's similar in action to Pramipexol, which is also Mirapex or Rapinrol Requip. So there's no reason to believe that it would act uh, differently. But it's absorbed differently. Sometimes people respond uh, differently to these medications. Yeah, so theoretically when it gets absorbed uh, through the skin, it's more of a continuous absorption, but uh, it depends. You know, there are all sorts of uh, things that, factors that come into play. If you're a sweaty type person and you sweat the patch off, you're really not getting consistent absorption. And so I think it just depends on the person. 
So, so for memory loss, and again, they'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a, in a future lecture, but the, the medic, same medications are, are a number of the same medications that we use for you know, Alzheimer's disease, for example, or even for Lewy body dementia, um, can also be helpful in, in Park, potentially helpful in, in Parkinson's disease memory problems. So we sometimes will utilize those. We also kind of do other things, treat the depression, treat the sleep problems, um, treat, uh, you know, make sure there's no vitamin deficiencies or, or thyroid problems, other contributors to the memory as well. Um, but there, there are a number of medications that are used in other dementias that can be helpful for, for this um, as well. That's correct, yeah. So, so the Azelect was, I mentioned the MAOBIs, the Selegiline or Sagiline. The brand name for one of those is, is uh, Azelect. Um, so that's un, under the category of uh, the uh, MAOBI uh, uh, inhibitors, which again uh, can potentially be a good uh, adjunctive agent. Uh, and again, uh, the warning with those is A, they can be very expensive, and B, they're probably not as good as carbidopa, levodopa, cinnamon. So uh, it can also, with uh, selegiline, sometimes can be a little activating, give people a little pep, which sometimes can be nice, uh, but sometimes can also uh, interfere with sleep a little bit. So. Uh, the question was, you know, protein and absorption of, of cinnamet, carbidopa, levodopa. Um, in theory, that uh, protein will decrease the absorption of the cinnamet, the carbidopa, levodopa. So for best absorption of it, they say don't eat uh, protein around the time you're taking your medication. Um, again, you know, it's a balancing act. If you take it with meals, uh, you may have decreased side effects, uh, or you may have decreased nausea, uh, GI side effects. It may be absorbed a little bit better. Um, so. So, so the question being for patients who have hallucinations, what, what, cla you know, what, counter what counts as dangerous? It's very uh, case by case. Um, certainly, I mean, on one extreme is they are taking a stick and trying to hit the hallucinations. They're running at the hallucinations. They're punching at them. They're calling the police about the hallucinations. But there's also more subtle shades of gray that, that can also be bothersome. If, if they're having long conversations with these hallucinations in the middle of the night or they're, you know, the, the hallucinations are telling them bad advice or, or things like that, um, you know, that, which, which certainly can happen. Um, I think it's very case by case, but certainly if it's, if it's getting bothersome, um, then I, I, you know, it's something where I'd consider potentially treating, but it's very case by case and, and uh, it kind of, it's just something you need to talk about with your neurologist uh, specifically. But, mm -hmm. Can be both. Um, so patients who have Parkinson's disease who, for example, aren't on Cinemet can absolutely get this, the, the drop in blood pressure upon standing, um, but Cinemet can also do the same thing. Um, you know, one thing we may uh, gauge is uh, obviously if we started this carbidopa, levodopa, the cinemet, and all of a sudden they're getting more lightheaded, then we can say, well, the medication is probably at this point doing a large part of that, but they may also be predisposed to drops in blood pressure already. So, the, you know, the drop in blood pressure can be both due to the disease and the medications. Um, and sometimes we're a little hamstrung in terms of prescribing the medications because we're worried it's going to cause further drops in blood pressure. And that's why it's important to be hydrated, to work on the salt, to lower blood pressure meds if needed, to give us, you know, some, you know, slightly selfishly in a sense, some more um, uh, leeway in terms of increasing the medications further to better control the other symptoms. So that's why it's very important. Familiar with Northera, the, which the, is uh, droxidopa. Yeah, the droxidopa. So that's one of the new, the, of the three medications we tend to use to bump up blood pressure, that's the newest of the three. Um, you know, it potentially could be very helpful. I haven't had a whole lot of experience using it yet. I've mainly been using the other two, the Midadrin, the Flornef, um, but uh, I think it's also a reasonable option. Uh, things to consider for that medication, extremely, extremely expensive, so it's not our first line that we go to, but it could potentially be a useful option if you've really got refractory trouble with lightheadedness on standing blood pressure drops. So, so does, you know, in what ways can Parkinson's affect vision and, and visual interpretation, such as reading? Um, uh, probably a few different types, a few different ways. People, you know, it could be as simple as you don't blink as much, so your eyes are getting drier, so that could impact that. Um, sometimes people who have had Parkinson's for a while may have trouble with some visual spatial interpretations. It can sometimes affect that as well. Um, uh, I think those are a couple things that come to mind. Dr. Chu, I'm not sure if there's any other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. So, so sometimes people with Parkinson's may have some trouble kind of um, getting their eye, certain eye movements, particularly converging, such, such as when you're reading, maybe a little trouble with, with those eye movements over time. So that could also contribute as well. So yes, they're... they're yeah, and, and it's one of those things where you know, a few things could come together. Yep. Um, so does the convergence insufficiency or, or similar issues, could that contribute to double vision? Um, potentially, although usually if, if there's concerns for double vision, I, I would probably say, you know, I would want you to check with your eye doctor to make sure there's nothing else going on there um, that, that could also be contributing to that. Anytime, you know, with, with, you know, a little blurry vision here and there, you know, I mean, it's always good to check with your eye doctor regardless. Double vision, I think it'd be reasonable to, to definitely check with them, make sure that that that's the explanation versus something else. Yeah, you can have 
double vision with convergence ins insufficiency, but it's usually close up because what happens is as you hold a piece of paper close up and reading it, the eyes can't move together to focus on it. So if the double vision is just with reading, uh, but far away vision is okay, then you can attribute the double vision to the convergence insufficiency. But if it's double vision, no matter where you look or all the time, that's a different story. So uh, again, this is a question about the chemotherapeutic drug, nilodenub, which I, I'm actually not sure I'm pronouncing it right, um, whether or not there's gonna be a clinical study or what's the likelihood. If, it, if they apply for funding and they are looking for sites to do it, we probably would apply to be a site to do that. I think we're, we're probably looking at a few years out, though, before that happens. So, so right now, we, we really don't have a way one way or the other to slow down that. So the question is, you know, with the brain cell death, the death of the dopamine cells, the neurodegenerative process in this, are there ways we can help protect the brain cells? Right now, we don't have anything, and, and we've tried a lot of different studies that have not shown significant benefit. They're still looking at a number of studies uh, to see what we can do. Um, again, I, I kind of pitch exercise as kind of the best thing we have right now to, to kind of keep things strong, but really we don't have great treatment right now to prevent the, the death of brain cells, the dopamine cells uh, in the brain at this time. Um, so there's no specific dietary, um, stu no studies that have, sh so the question is low carb diet, uh, is there any benefit there? And in, in general, there's no study that has shown benefit from a particular type of diet in Parkinson's disease. Um, what I generally tell people is just eat a you know, healthy diet, um, you know, uh, uh, as best as possible, well-balanced, healthy diet is probably your best, best bet in general. Because um, anytime, if you're, if you're having an unhealthy diet and your cholesterol's up, your blood pressure's up, and if you had increased risk for other health problems down the road, that's just one more thing to worry about and one more thing that could affect the brain. So I just say healthy diet in general is the best we, we have, um, not a specific type of diet. Um, you know, it depends if he's awake at night uh, is, is the big thing. Because if someone's you know, clearly asleep and they're acting out their dreams, um, you know, that that's, could be the, the REM sleep behavior disorder. If they're awake but it's nighttime, they're lying in bed and they're seeing things at night, they're seeing people or, or animals or shapes or things, um, then that, that could be more you know, nocturnal nighttime hallucinations. Um, so just the, the timing of the day doesn't matter. It, it's more kind of um, the situation is the person awake and asleep. Sometimes that can get muddled a little bit um, because it's hard to say sometimes if you're just waking up or if you're fully awake or if you're still asleep. Um, but it's something you want to mention to your doctor if there, if there is nighttime things that are being seen, particularly if there's concerns that they're, you know, it's getting disruptive or it's you know, at all dangerous. Uh, so the question is, any loss of teeth dentition problems as a result of Parkinson's disease? Um, nothing that immediately comes to mind for me aside from, you know, I mean, if, if you're not swallowing as much, you have excessive drool, could you have more at risk for cavities and such? It's kind of a smaller reason, but I'm not sure, Dr. Chu, if anything. Yeah, so uh, sometimes if, uh, if, it depends on how you're brushing your teeth, right? If, you're, mm -hmm. if your hand is not yeah. as coordinated and you might not be able to get to some of the, the back teeth that, as well as you would if you didn't have those uh, dexterity type problems, mm -hmm. um, that can lead to cavities and lead to poor dentition. Um, but that, and then sometimes people, um, as the disease progresses, the mouth can hang open a little bit more. There's more drooling, uh, leading to more dry mouth, and that can actually lead to more cavities and, and dental problems. So uh, it may be a contributor. I, I don't know that that's going to be true for everyone who has Parkinson's disease. So the question is, by, by the time you actually start to have symptoms of Parkinson's, you've already lost a lot of your dopamine-producing cells by that point. The disease had already been going on for a while. And that's something that we've, I think, really understood more and more, that, that you kind of have Parkinson's, in a sense, for many years before it gets bad enough that your body can't compensate anymore and that you start to show symptoms. Um, and that's one of the reasons in, in, in research in particular, we're trying to find ways and working on ways to, to um, see early signs of Parkinson's uh, earlier um, so that we can intervene um, before you've lost a huge number of the dopamine cells to kind of get ahead of it as best we can, not when we're already you know, very far along. By the time you manifest symptoms, you know, there's, there's, the disease has been going on for many years kind of invisibly in a sense. Um, so. Okay, thank you very much.